side. I'm just going to mute now. All right. Baruch Atah Adonai Lehenem Bechelam Shehakon Ebed Borei. Bechayim everybody, Bechayim. To life, Bechayim Ebrecha. To life and to blessings. And that's what we do every week. To increase life and blessings, learning from the Parsha. And this Parsha indeed. As we come to the final plagues, last three plagues, and the last one in particular, Ramesh duly warns Pharaoh of the impending demise of every firstborn. And uh, he leaves the final court, he leaves uh, for the final time the royal court. And what happens thereafter? Jewish people now need to prepare for the, for the great exodus. That's what needs to happen. So let's take a look at this week's Parsha. Let me share the screen. Okay, you see in front of you. And Hashem spoke to Moshe and to Arain in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be the head of the months. To you, it shall be the first of the months of the year. And of course, this is Chodesh Nisan, when God is telling this, which is the month of the Exodus. So Pes Pesach, Passover, will be counted as the first month of the year, in the rather, in the first month of the year. Now, yeah, being the 15th in the month, but of the first month of the year. Now, we all know that Rosh Hashanah is on the first day of the seventh month when it comes to counting the months, right? This, though, is, as the verse says, this month, Achidesh uh, Hazeh, is the phrase, which will teach us about the process of what it means a new month, how it's determined, and um, when it appears that it is considered a new month, we learn from, as Rashi says, Rashi's God said to him, to Moshe, when the moon renews itself, you will have a new month. Moshe struggled to determine the precise moment of the renewal of the month, at what size it should appear before it is fit for sanctification. So God showed him with his finger the moon in the sky and said to him, you shall see a moon like this and sanctify the month. So subsequently, the Sanhedrin, after Moshe Rabbeinu, the high, high Jewish court, they were mandated to calculate and certify when the months are, and that's very important because as a result, that's when we celebrate the holidays, right? You can only know the holidays when they are, when we know when the months are. Now, this particular mitzvah is a very difficult one when we learn it in the Rambam, and some of it is very obscure, but it's an important one that we need to understand. But today we're going to just give a little basic overview and go through one particular idea that stands out that we need some clarification. So today, of course, we know that we go by a calendar, right? Uh, in the fourth century of the Common Era, the sage Hill II, he foresaw that the Sanhedrin was going to uh, be disbanded and there would no longer be a rabbinical court that would be able or have the power and mandate to make and establish the new months. So therefore, he created a calendar. That calendar is a 19-year cycle that repeats itself, for the most part, every 19 years, and um, which has 12 regular years and seven leap years. This year, of course, is a leap year. It's one of those times, right? 
How does this work? I'm sure we're all familiar with the basic idea. A lunar month is 29 and a half days, slightly more than 29 and a half, 29 days, a little more than 12 hours um, as a result. And the Torah tells us that it that the new month is based on sighting of witnesses, which would be, you know, on the 29th, of the, on the 30th of the night, of that night. And they would um, come to the high court. They would come to the high court and figure out, uh, based with the high court, um, when the witnesses would come with the cross examination, if they're cross, after the cross examination, it was accepted their testimony, and then the court would proclaim that this is Rosh Chodesh, that this day is indeed the first day of the month. Um, now, of course, sometimes it'd be a difficulty because it would be a cloudy day and no one could really see the moon. Not like uh, TJ, who's in Australia right now in the morning, who's showing us a beautiful sky uh, doesn't look like there's any problems with seeing a new moon over there. But if you, if I were showing you the sky over here and the cloudy day we had over here with, you know, some uh, snowflakes and whatnot, then uh, definitely we would not be able to see it uh, clearly over here. Now, the truth is uh, Jerusalem is not, uh, is where it, it takes place. But yet, even in Jerusalem, even they have beautiful uh, blue skies, but yet there can be times that it's cloudy and you would not be able to perceive what's going on. So the Rambam teaches us the process over here. Let's go through that process. The high court would make calculations in a manner resembling the calculations of astronomers who know the location of the stars and their paths in their orbits. They would perform careful research and determine whether or not they would be able to sight the moon at an appropriate time the 30th night. The judges determined that it was possible to sight the moon. They would sit waiting for witnesses to come and testify throughout the entire 30th day. If witnesses came, the court examined their testimony according to law, verified the truth of their statements, and the court would sanctify the new month. If the moon was not sighted and witnesses did not come, they would complete the 30th day, thus making the full month, right? It would be a full month. It, if according to the calculations, the judges knew that it was impossible for the moon to be sighted, they would not sit in session on the 30th day, nor would they wait for the arrival of witnesses. If witnesses came, they would know that they were false witnesses or the clouds appeared uh, to them in a form of resembling the moon, but it was not the real moon. All right, we're learning Rambam over here as we do every day. <laughs> um, So the Rambam uh, continues and, and tells us, you know, that there were people, you know, who, who would be coming? The people that didn't live far from Jerusalem. You know, if you lived in Tzfat, you weren't coming uh, to, to you know, give bare testimony on, on the new moon. If you live not far from Jerusalem, so uh, you, you would come. But, you know, a lot of people live not far from Jerusalem. So many people, if they see the moon, what would they say to themselves? Well, I don't need to go. Someone else will go. And the problem with that is, of course, what would happen? No one will go with that kind of attitude. So the Rambam writes, there was a large courtyard in Jerusalem that was called the Beit Yazek. All the witnesses coming to testify about the new moon would gather there and the court would examine them there. They would prepare great feasts for them so that the people would willing, be willingly willing to come. So it's a great feast because it's a great mitzvah that's fulfilling. So they can create a, a big feast for them that way, they indeed will come. The pair of witnesses that arrived first would be examined first. They would bring in the greater of the two and say to him, tell us how did you see the moon? Was it in front of the sun or behind the sun to, to its north or to the south? How high was the moon over the horizon and which direction and did it tilt? And how wide was it? Then they would bring in his counterpart um, because people, you know, you need two witnesses to for a testimony. So you came in twos usually. So you bring a counterpart and examine him. If the statements match, the testimony would be accepted. Then they asked all of the other pairs of witnesses certain general questions, 
not because they needed additional testimony, but so that the witnesses should not leave disappointed and so that they would be accustomed to come. Then the head of the court would say, uh, it's sanctified. And all the people uh, responded after him, it is sanctified, it is sanctified. Mekudish, Mekudish, they would respond. That's the process of what would take place. So, so again, the court would sit only when they knew that it was possible to see a new moon, right? Because they were all astronomers, they had to be, uh, to be on the high court. So they knew exactly the position, they knew exactly the shape, they knew exactly um, how it should be looking that month and what position, and therefore they would exa cross-examine the witnesses. And this is all dictated at, by the Torah. And then they would, um, then they would formally express based on the witnesses and announce that it was Rosh Chodesh, Mekodesh, sanctified. Now, interesting to note that what happens if they went through this whole process and they didn't say one word, Mekodesh, sanctified. It's sanctified. You know what happens? It's not Rosh Chodesh. The new month is postponed. Rambam writes, even if the court and the entire Jewish people saw the moon, but the court did not declare it is sanctified before the, the nightfall beginning the 31st day, or if the witnesses were cross-examined. But afterwards, the court was not able to declare that it was sanctified before the nightfall beginning the 31st day. It should not be sanctified, and the month should be full despite the fact that the moon was sighted on the 30th night, it is the 31st that will be the Rosh Chodesh. For the sanctification of the new month is not established by the sighting of the moon, but by the court that declares that it is sanctified. Wow, interesting. God told to Moshe, it is not the moon or the calendar or the witnesses that determine the new moon, but it's the proclamation of the basin of the, of the Jewish court. And without that, it's not a valid, um, it, 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 it's not valid that day to be considered Rosh Chodesh. Interesting. You see the power of a Jewish court, right? Now, what happened if on the night of the 30th, in a month when there was not or could not have been a new moon? Whatever the situation was, it was not possible there'd be a new moon. But the court proclaimed a new moon by saying, Mekudish, that it's sanctified. In other words, the court knows, right? They're astronomers, they know. So it can't be. But for whatever reason, error whatever it is, the court says the Kuddish. So the halacha, halacha is, it's sanctified. It's proclaimed as such. It is as such, as the Rambam writes. Once the court sanctifies the new month, it remains sanctified regardless of whether they erred unwittingly, they were led astray by false witnesses maybe, or they were forced to sanctify it for whatever reason. For whatever reason. We are required to calculate the dates of the festival based on the day that they sanctified. And it's the beginning of the new month. Even if the person knows that the court erred, he is obligated to rely on them for the matter uh, is entrusted to them alone. So you might ask and be wondering, how could this be? How can we accept a ruling of a court that has clearly missed the mark? How can we be confident in the observance of the festivals of Pesach that year or Sukkot that year, right? Um, when we know that that day is not the actual day of Rosh Chodesh. So the Rambam says the answer is actually pretty simple. And he says the same God that commanded us to sanctify the moon and observe the festivals based on um, 
that sanctification is the same God that commanded us to rely on the court, even if they made a mistake, as the Rambam says. The one who commanded us to observe the festivals is the one who commanded us to rely on them, the court, as implied by the verse in Leviticus, which you will pronounce as the days as a holy convocation. Okay. So we need to rely on that. We need to depend on that. Even if the public might be thinking otherwise, and maybe knowing, you know, the, the physical reality as something else. But how do we understand this? I mean, it's true, it's the same God, but how do we understand that God's wisdom and his truth in the Torah would not match up with the reality on the field, so to speak, right? How can it be that a basin's hand hands down a ruling that would be inconsistent with an observable reality? It's not that we're questioning the observable reality, right? Um, that's not what the court is doing or what the halacha is, right? So we need to think about this. So, so, um, You know, living now in COVID and, and here in Montreal, we, we, we got a lockdown over here. We have, um, we're, we're not allowed to go out from 10 o'clock at night. Um, we're not allowed to go out. We are uh, confined, restricted to our homes. Um, and even today, all the stores were closed. Sunday, they're gonna close all the stores. Nothing can be open. So, you know, this is having a devastating effect on people. People are rebelling. They even closed down the synagogues. So you can't even have synagogues open. I mean, any house of worship. So this is being contested and, you know, being dealt with, but the, the point is um, there's a very dark reality that is affecting people here, and I, I'm sure elsewhere also, even, you know, where you don't have as such draconian um, legislation and laws as here, uh, it's still, it's having a, a great effect. But we have to kind of rethink this. And, you know, we've dealt with this before and we're going to deal with this concept again and express it in a different manner um, about reality. How do we view reality? So let's look at the Talmud. And a very, uh, this is an argument in the Talmud that is well known. We've learned this in the past. Some of you might be uh, familiar with it. There's actually discussion of, you know, creation of the world. When was the world created? So like all good Jewish things, you know, it's not so simple. As it says in Talmud Rosh Hashanah, it's taught in a brisa. By the way, look at the Hebrew over there, Tanya. Tanya means it's brought a, taught in a brisa. Right. By the way, a reminder, eight o'clock tonight. Join us on Instagram, YouTube. The world was created in Tishrei. Rabbi Elezer says the world was created in Tishrei. Rabbi Yeshua says the world was created in Nisan. What's going on over here? How could you have such an argument? When is the birthday? You know, <laughs> the world has two birthdays. I mean, you know, every kid wants to have two birthdays. Probably every adult also, you know. <laughs> Um, how could that be? What does that mean? So Taisvais explains, Taisvais is the grandson of Rashi, uh, Rebbein Tam, and explains that both opinions are the word of a living God. You can therefore explain that Nisan, God had the idea to create the world, but it was not actually created until Tishrei. 
So uh, let's give a metaphor for this. You know, if anybody ever started a business or have you ever started a, a venture in something, right? You're sitting around with a friend or two or whatever, how many, you know, and you're, and you're talking about it. And, and, and the discussion goes into great detail and depth about this new venture that you want to join in. Again, whether it's a business enterprise or, or you know, some other uh, idea or venture that you want to do something for the community, whatever it is, right? Um, and at one point, well, if it's a business, so you, you, know, you get together and you actually incorporate um, the, the, the business. So wh when was the birth of the business? When did it, when did it, when was it born? When it was incorporated? Or when you sat around the table and, you know, you, you had these crazy ideas that you, you know, brought together and you came up with a vision for this business or this venture. So when would it be? Well, obviously both are true, right? So the same thing is over here. The first of Tishrei marks the world's creation that in fact, but Rabbi Lezer doesn't disagree that that's the physical existence that was created then. Rabbi Yeshua adds to that. He says the first of Nisan is the birthday of the world because that's when the project was originally conceived. Now, what does that mean God is conceiving something? Well, it means he had a vision. He had a purpose. That comes from God. And that vision becomes a driving force for the physical reality that is created six months later. Rosh Chodesh Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. Right? But the Torah wants to let us know that what is driving this creation of a physical reality of this world. What's, what's driving it? Well, the Torah tells us. The very first Pesach in Chomish, it says, Bereish is bara. In the beginning, God's creation. This verse calls forth from Midrashic interpretation, Rashi says, as our a rabbi stated, God created the world for the sake of Torah, which is called Rashi's beginning of his way in Proverbs, and for the sake of Israel, the Jewish people who are called Rashi is beginning of his reign. So the Torah is the vision, right, for the business. And the world is the business, which is designed to bring in, in, bring in the vision to life. You can't separate the two from each other. Without the vision, the world serves no purpose. And that's a relationship between Torah and the world. Torah is the vision of God, his purpose for creating the world. It's kind of like a body and a soul, right? You have a body, but the body wasn't created for the sake of a body. It was created that it can fulfill the vision of the soul. Right? That's what we learn in Tanya. Right? The battle between the two. So deep down in the body of this world, there's a spiritual purpose in which God created it. Is that clear? So that leads us to a very interesting conclusion that Nisan, right, is celebrated as the deeper purpose of creation, the soul of the world. And its existence is totally based on Torah-inspired vision. Tishrei, on the other hand, is merely the creation, the body that came into existence. As Rebbe explains, the underlying thought behind something that is the internal dimension, that is the goal and the purpose of the action, that actually turns the thought into reality. It emerges that the physical creation of Tishrei represents the external dimension of creation, while Nisan marks the inner dimension of creation. Is that clear? Any questions on this?
So to this notion that Torah is the vision, right? Therefore, the driving force, just like, you know, when you're sitting around the table and you're coming up with this new venture, you have a vision, it becomes a driving force of everything that you do in a physical reality and running your day-to-day -day affairs in, the, in, in, this, in, in this undertaking, this business. Let's call it a business, right? So the Zoyer adds another fascinating dimension to this, and it's an idea that I'm sure we're familiar with, that the Torah is actually the very blueprint of God's creation. Just like in a building, every aspect of the building fits the blueprint in order that it should be, you know, uh, built as desired by the builder. So like the builder of this world, everything in this world down to the simple mug is built based on the blueprints of Torah right? It's the driving force of everything. So when we study Torah do it and fulfill its commandments, we're keeping the vision going, as the Zohar states. Anyone who looks into Torah and toils in it is considered to uphold the world's existence, just as God looked into Torah to create the world. A person looks into Torah and upholds the world. Now, this is very interesting because this is a, kind of a little counterintuitive to the metaphor that we're using of a business. Or, or, or sorry, not a business. Um, for the business, we had the vision. The vision needs to be constantly there, right? If you lose the vision of the business, that's when a business is going to go AWOL. That's when the business is going to become defunct ultimately because it's not based on the vision of what this company is meant to do. But here we're talking about a different metaphor and that is of blueprints. So when you're building a home, so God's creating a world, he's using the blueprints, but what do you do after you build a home? You don't hold on to the blueprints. I mean, maybe you store them somewhere because maybe one day there's gonna be something wrong in the walls of the plumbing and you wanna know where the plumbing is. So therefore you could go and you know fix it at the right place. So you need the, you know, but that's only if there's something wrong, you don't need it on a daily basis. So that's not fit our metaphor over here because the blueprints of the world here are the vision and therefore the creative force of everything in the physical world in a consistent basis. The Torah speaks primarily in spiritual realms and a loose secondary in the lower realms. Ah, so what this is saying then is as follows. What is the true reality? Is what we see in the physical world the true reality? Or is it the spiritual reality as Torah sees it in the spiritual realm? So here, Rabbi Menachem Azariah, Kabbal uh, Kabbalist, says that, well, the Torah is primarily speaking about in the spiritual realm, and it alludes secondarily to the physical. So what is the true reality is the spiritual, not the material. The physical is only an expression of the spiritual. Because after all, this, the, the physical is an outcome of the vision and the blueprints of Torah. Is that clear? And yes. That, that's clear. Yeah, that's clear. Good. Thumbs up. We got a thumbs up over here. All right. So comes to and gives us a transformational idea over here of a Torah study and approach to life in general. Simply put, what we perceive in the physical reality 
is not necessarily so. Because again, what is the physical reality? It's expressing the vision of Torah and the blueprints of Torah that stem from a spiritual reality. So on this basis, the Rebbe addresses the question that we asked in the previous in the previous section. How could we observe Rosh Chodesh when the rabbis pronounced it, when it's clear contradiction to the obvious astronomical reality? Others, the reality we see is what? It's not Rosh Chodesh today, but the rabbis proclaim the Kodesh, that it's sanctified. And what's the law? Indeed, it is sanctified. So let's understand that. So based on what we just learned. So what is the moon? The moon is only a representation of a spiritual source that is the blueprint and the vision of Torah. In other words, the spiritual moon. There's a spiritual moon as it's in Torah. Right? Now, the physical moon, we know, is a cycle of 29.5 days. It waxes and wanes, it disappears and reappears. The same cycle occurs also in spiritual realm. On the contrary, that's where it comes from. The fact that the moon acts this way is because in the spiritual realm, it is that way. So, so considering that Torah is telling us to base the months on the Jewish calendar on the cycle of the moon. So what are we saying? It's not the physical moon. It's the physical moon that is a reflection or represented by the spiritual one. Now, the rabbis are instructed to calculate based on the physical moon. Right? To witnesses and they have to you know, check them out and so on, right? But that physical moon, what is it though? It's a reflection of its source, the spiritual moon as it is in Torah, as it is in the blueprints and the vision of Torah. In other words, the physical moon is only a symbol of the spiritual moon that is Rosh Chodesh, when we render Rosh Chodesh. Let's see how the Rebbe explains this. The sun and the moon, in a physical sense, like everything else physical, result from the spiritual version of the sun and the moon above. The fact that we mark the day of a new moon as Rosh Chodesh then is primarily associated with the spiritual new moon. However, in as much as our awareness of the spiritual matters is through their physical representation down here, the Torah instructed us to set Rosh Chodesh according to the parameters of the physical new moon, either by the sighting or by the calculation, because that's what tells us when the spiritual new moon occurs, right? So we're physical people. So Torah is telling us, physical people, okay, so you need to make your calculations based on the physical awareness that you have of the moon over here. And don't make a mistake. That's not what it's about. That physical calculation that you're making down here is aligned with the spiritual Right, because it's only everything from the spiritual is reflected in the physical. So when I know the physical, it brings me now to understand the spiritual counterpart. Right, that makes sense. But what happens if the two don't align? Here we're saying, you know, they align. But what if they don't align? the spiritual with the physical. For example, or the vision with the day-to-day -day conduct of a business. You had a business, you had a vision that you sat around the table and this is your vision of what you wanted to accomplish. And for some reason, the vision that you wanted to accomplish is not now holding out in the day-to-day -day running of this business. Right? So what should guide you? 
Now, you have to be aware of the reality. But what's your guiding? What is guiding you? The reality that it's all playing itself out and now I'm changing my vision? You don't change your vision. Your vision is your vision, right? That's your, that's your vision. Your vision is based on what you hold dear and, and, and important to you. You're not changing that. You're not circumventing that because that's your, that's your truth. That's your values. That's what's important to you. So you're not changing that, right? Now, you may have to deal with the obstacles that how come it's not aligning? Fine. That's in the business, but you're not changing that. So in a similar way over here, what happens if two realities don't always align perfectly, right? Meaning in Torah. In other words, Torah has a vision versus the reality on the ground. So in a perfect world, every physical object would be a shining specimen of godliness, pronouncing that it is a creation of God and it is, you know, in sync with the blueprints of Torah, right? But, hey, you know, the world isn't that way. As a matter of fact, the world in Hebrew is olam. Olam comes from the word helam. It is a concealment. It's the opposite is true. There are a lot of things that conceal on the spiritual connection of the physical world with its source in God and in Torah. That we understand. This is the idea of a bracha, by the way. You know, you give a bracha to somebody. What does that mean? A blessing. Someone's not well and you give them a blessing. Well, what that means is, in their spiritual source above, they have the capacity of being healed. A bracha means you're just drawing it down here, that it should be a reality in that person's physical life down here. Sometimes, by the way, a bracha doesn't help. You know why? Because in their spiritual reality above, there is no healing. That's when prayer can change a reality. Blessing doesn't change a reality. Blessing draws down the spiritual reality down here. But sometimes that spiritual reality isn't there. Then you need a prayer, right? Because prayer can change the spiritual reality. Blessing doesn't. Now, so let's take that metaphor of the blessing, though, because that fits in over here. Blessing means that in my spiritual source, there is healing at this moment. It just hasn't been come. It's in the spiritual realm. It just hasn't come down here. Blessing means we draw it down here to align it with the physical reality over here, which is, of course, what, you know, what we want. Right? But there's not always that perfect alignment. Why? Because there's a concealment on God in this physical world. Therefore, the spiritual source of where things come from don't align at all times. And that's this problem over here, the interplay between the spiritual moon as it is envisioned, its vision, its blueprint in Torah with the cycle of the physical moon down here. It's possible, as the Rebbe explains, that the spiritual sense of the moon, it has arrived. In spiritual realm, it's a new moon. But it's not been aligned down here in a physical sense that it's reflected in the physical world. This physical world is concealing it. What does that mean? Just like every, mit every mitzvah brings a new light into this world, right, that aligns the spiritual with the physical down here to bring new light by doing an act of a mitzvah, bringing and introducing into this world, just like a bracha is drawing down that which we have in our spiritual realm of healing, right, again, if it's there, but a mitzvah, every time you do it, you're drawing a new light, new divine energy into this world. Well, what defines the new energies? Torah, as it is in the blue, the the vision, the, the blueprints of creation. So when the sages said, Mekudish said, sanctified, what they're saying is that in the spiritual realm, it's Rosh Chodesh. Meaning 
that light of Rosh Chodesh is now going to be drawn down to this world as a result of the power that every one of us has in doing any mitzvah we draw it down. And they have that specific mitzvah to do it through sanctifying the new month, making the proclamation. So they're the ones who are drawing that reality down here. Not reality in the aligned in the physical sense with the moon, but a reality of the spiritual reality that indeed above it is Rosh Chodesh. And therefore, they're able to draw that energy of what Rosh Chodesh represents and brings into this world. The physical moon just kind of got delayed in a traffic jam. It didn't catch up, wasn't aligned. So what comes out over here is that the reality of Rosh Chodesh is not because of uh, an observable new moon. That's how we simple folk down here generally are going to know this, right? That's how we're commanded uh, physical beings to work through the physical reality of this world. But in fact, what we're doing here, what the uh, uh, basin is doing, is drawing through the mitzvah, the command that they, they've been given to sanctify and therefore bring this new light into this world. That's a spiritual thing. That far outweighs the physical reality over here. So therefore, the Torah tells you, proclaim it as Rosh Chodesh, even though the physical reality and astronomical, you know, reality of where the moon is, it's not there. Spiritual moon has arrived. Physical moon is stuck somewhere. How's that possible? Well, that's a concealment of this world. But that doesn't interfere with the power of the based in that it's given to them by their sanctification, fulfillment of this mitzvah, that they introduce this new light, because in reality, that new light is a spiritual thing. And in reality, the new moon is arrived in spiritual terms, although in physical terms it hasn't. So it explains. However, when the court sets Rosh Chodesh on a different day in the case the Torah tells us that nevertheless rely upon them. This itself proves that it is on that day which the Torah of truth determines to be Rosh Chodesh, when the primary new moon occurs above. As for the fact that the physicality of the new moon takes place on a different day, that's because this world, for various reasons, not fit for the flow of the, of the moon above to be expressed in the moon below at the same time. Ah. The world isn't fit for it yet, right? There isn't an alignment in this world that it is fit in order to express it in the physical. That's what it means. Not the world isn't fit for the light, but that it should be expressed in the physical reality over here. How many times do we live something that we know is spiritual truth and for some reason, it just doesn't reflect itself always in the physical reality of my life or the world around me, right? Does it take away from that spiritual truth? Does it take away from the vision that you had in making the business, you know, that you wanted a business that would be, uh, you, know, um, you know, dedicated to its employees that would be, uh, you know, uh, create a, a beautiful a loving environment and you know and and that would be um, cutting edge uh, you know uh, technology that would be beneficial to humanity you know da, 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 da. Um, that's beautiful vision and, and beautiful things sometimes you get things that are obstacles in the way but your vision of the good that you want to accomplish and how you want to change the world for good, that's not what needs, that's a reality, that's, that, that's your truth, that's your spiritual, uh, you know, your, your spiritual being, that's what guides you, well, that's what guides God in creating the world on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, his vision, the blueprint of Torah, that's what guides, and 
yes, there can be um, stumbling blocks on the way. There can be uh, obstacles and, and challenges on the way, but it doesn't take away from the vision. And not only doesn't take away from the vision, the, the uniqueness over here is that vision actually is being fulfilled, not in an entirety because it's not being reflected in the physical reality, right? But it is a spiritual reality that is nonetheless being drawn down into this world um, because that's the power of every mitzvah that we do. The mitzvah that we do creates a new divine energy, creates as the union of Ma'uban, the union of Kuchibrich and Shechinte, of uh, the male part of God, the Holy One, blessed be He, and the female part of the Shechina, of the divine presence, creates that union every time we do a mitzvah and we bring that down. Not always do we experience it in the physical reality, but it doesn't take away at all that it is our true reality. So, you know, when, you, when the business is stuck with the obstacles and the challenges, so, you know, don't change your spiritual values. Don't change your vision. You got to, you know, work harder to bring that vision into fruition and not allow the obstacles to, uh, to you know, to, uh, to be, you know, to determine our, uh, and guide us in what we need to do. And that's the lesson over here that we learn. All right, so, you know, what world do we want to live in? We can live in the world of uh, COVID where there's lockdown here. I mean, it, it's, it, it's draconian compared to anybody anywhere else in the world. I think even Australia is ahead of us right now. Um, TJ maybe, even though they had lockdown in Melbourne for over a hundred days uh, previously. Um, but here, you know, uh, um, yeah, schools are not starting for another two weeks. Everywhere else is starting on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I'm here for another two weeks afterwards. So I, I, whether it's right or wrong, uh, that's not even the point. My point is that this is, um, you know, are you living in that reality? Is that, you know, the physical reality as we uh, uh, over here, or you live in your spiritual reality, the vision, the blueprint that God has, and, and, and that that's the true reality and, and on the contrary, from the spiritual realm, it will create the physical realm down here. And that's what, you know, in creation, right? The vision that God had that it was uh, expressed by the physical creation of the world on, on Rosh Hashanah. But the vision is what is inspiring us. The spiritual truths that we live with is truly the bubble that we want to be in and not into the, the you know, the bubble of, of COVID or any other thing things in this, in our lives that are holding us up, that are not in sync with our spiritual truths. Our, uh, our reality as Torah dictates it to us and, and gives us, you know, the, the wisdom in what to do and, and the uh, blueprints and how to lead our lives. So when we stay strong with that, then um, nothing and even that is not aligned with it in this world will hold us off kilter because you know what we're going to do? We're going to say like the sages, Mekodesh, 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 right? I mean, the sages say at the, the, the court of law that it's Mekodesh, that's sanctified. And we answer back, Mekodesh, Mekodesh, that's sanctified. And, and meaning that our lives are sanctified, that we bring down goodness and, and godliness into this world, irrespective of the alignment of uh, the reality uh, that's out there, because that's not my reality that I live with and buy into or, or make as my um, guiding light. Achayim. Any questions? Thank you. Wow, you guys are amazing. You got it. Yes. It's clear. Is the message clear? Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Wonderful class. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah, thank you, Celia. Wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right, eight o'clock. Don't forget, Very folks. Clear. Thank you. What's at eight thank o'clock? Thank you. Oh, TJ. Oh, Australia. Look at the blue, clear blue sky over there. Oh. <laughs>
What's that oh, reality is reflecting the spiritual reality over there. <laughs> What's at eight o'clock? Eight o'clock, I will be with Rabbi Minus Friedman on either Instagram, the Tanya Rabbi on Instagram, you can get me, or on YouTube, you can catch me there. These are um, where Rabbi Friedman says, uh, um, Manus Friedman. I sent out the, the, the link. Thank you. I sent out the link. Hopefully you have it. Wait, Thank you. Did, did, was an email sent out? Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I got thing. an email about it. <laughs> you got, okay. Adil, uh, Adil, you got an email? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank Looking you. forward. Thank you. We'll see yes. you soon. Be well, folks. All the best. Thank you, Rabbi. Looking uh -huh. forward to, to uh, Thank you. Yep. the class. Thank you. Have a good and, night. Uh, ask your questions. PJ, Australia. Yes. <laughs> Be well. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>